may have left. So uh, I know Dr. Karina has uh, surgery this morning, so we'll let her go up next. Uh, she's going to be talking to us about uh, machine uh, vision. Uh, so Dr. Karina, go ahead. Thank you so much, Mohammed. It's a pleasure to be here. Can you all see my screen? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, so um, it's, al it's always really cool to see um, Mirza's talk on um, the augmented reality. And um, I'm really thrilled to be talking to you today about a, a different tool in spine surgery. I know today we get to hear about lots of exciting technologies and I've been asked to speak specifically about machine vision guided navigation. Um, it's not going to be quite as sexy as robotics or augmented reality. Um, here are my disclosures. I was a consultant in the past for the company um, that I'm speaking about, um, as well as for some other companies that do not have machine vision navigation. So I think the first question is why we should be using navigation or image guidance in the first place. Um, my goal today is to um, is to hopefully convince you that this should be standard of care in your practice. Um, I believe it's of utmost importance that we are placing our screws and doing our surgeries with the highest accuracy and high precision uh, because our job is truly very high stakes, okay? And, and a misplaced screw can be devastating um, for our patients. When we have looked at meta-analyses where we're comparing conventional, so freehand placement of screws throughout the entire spine, um, and we compare these to 2D placement with fluoroscopy um, versus 3D navigation, whether that's with any type of image, with any type of navigation modality that we'll talk about. We see across the board for cervical, thoracic, and lumbar screws, there is a significant increase in accuracy when you go from freehand to fluoroscopy to 3D navigation, where you're higher than 90% throughout all areas of the spine when you're using navigation. Um, and, and one of our group's own meta-analyses of over 50,000 screws, we find that CT navigation has the highest accuracy um, compared to freehand and fluoroscopy. So, you know, I put these images here to tell you freehand is essentially like a compass, you know, would, who of us would go to a new city and use a compass or an old fashioned map to get around, right? None of us, we're all on GPS on our phones and that's what, um, that's what 3D navigation provides us in the operating room. Um, so, I, I will I will preface this by saying that I actually use different um, imaging modalities and different navigation modalities in the operating room. Um, so I still use traditional CT guided um, intra, um, modalities such as stealth navigation, for example. Um, and I think that these are great for minimally invasive fusions, for example. So this is a patient who presented into our emergency department, a 77 year old male, multiple medical comorbidities, including cardiac disease, um, COPD, he had a history of of prostate cancer, and now he had a rising PSA with no known metastases. He came into another hospital um, with five days of lower back pain, progressive lower extremity weakness, and now unable to walk for the last 36 hours. He was full strength in his upper extremities. Um, his right lower extremity was three proximally um, and fours, and then two distally. Um, and then he was also weak in his left lower extremity. You can see his imaging here showed multi-level um, metastatic disease with contrast enhancement in multiple vertebral bodies in the mid-thoracic spine, as well as with a dorsal epidural component that was causing severe spinal cord compression. So this is an example of a patient that I felt was a very good candidate for a minimally invasive fusion, given his um, given his cancer, the need for post-operative radiation and chemotherapy. Um, so he underwent a multi-level uh, spinal fusion as well and decompression um, for metastatic cancer. And this is with the O-arm and, um, and the stealth um, intraoperative navigation that I'm sure that many of you are familiar with. So I believe that stealth really is um, great in many um, in many conditions, and this basically applies to any type of intraoperative CT guided navigation that needs an intraoperative CT scan. Um, it can be great for patients that have trauma without significant compression, and this is specifically for MIS cases. Um, it can be great for hybrid or mini open and separation tumor surgeries like this one I showed you. Um, I love to use this for degenerative disease with primarily foraminal stenosis. If I treat them with inner bodies, for example, anteriorly, and then um, go posteriorly and use MIS navigation for that. 
Um, and there's obviously many different pitfalls that can happen with this as we teach all of our residents and fellows in the op operating room, optimizing our clamp placements, not touching the clamp because that means you need to get a repeat spin. Um, and of course, navigation can be off if you manipulate retract soft tissue too much. Um, so now I'm going to go in and tell you about when I use this machine vision navigation in the operating room. So here's another case. Um, this is a 52 year old female who came in. She was a pedestrian versus auto. She had multiple traumas, including some very severe abdominal and aortic injuries that led her to go to the operating room multiple times with, uh, general surgery and CT surgery on her first day of admission. And she was also found to have this severe, unstable T10 fracture. So when you're using um, more, some of our more traditional um, CT guided based navigation platforms in the operating room, like the stealth navigation, um, if you have a patient with a really unstable spine like this, you'd certainly have options where you can place a clamp superiorly and inferiorly. Uh, but one of the things that I always worry about is when you have a really unstable spine, if your clamp moves relative to um, the spine, then obviously your navigation is going to be off and you're going to have to bring in your O-arm or your other device and get a repeat scan. So this is an example of a case where I think that the 7D machine vision navigation can be really useful. Um, and that's what I ended up using in this particular case. So I'll take you through kind of step-by-step, step, first of all, how machine vision navigation works. Um, so the um, this machine vision navigation basically works um, using vision. So it's the same technology that you have, for example, in a Tesla with the self-driving car. Um, and there are basically hundreds of cameras that are in the um, in the light that sits above the field. And can you guys see my my arrow as I'm pointing to the screen? Yes or no? I, I can't see any. So. No, you can't see it. Okay. Oh, no, well, then we I, no, oh, no, you we do. You? Okay, great. So the cameras are present in this light. Um, and this is what you bring in over the field. Um, and so they take a picture of the actual of, of your actual operative field. Um, and then they use that to co-register it with the pre-operative CT scan that you've obtained for this patient. So as long as you get a CT scan that's less than two millimeter slice thickness, we usually aim for 0.625 before the surgery, you're able to get a picture of your operative field in a few seconds that you can then register with your pre-operative scan. So that prevents you from having to bring in an O-arm or another machine and do a spin in the operating room. Um, so I'll take you through this step by step. So if you have a case, um, you'll position the patient uh, normally. You do need to use the C arm in order to approximate the level and see where you are. And then in this case, um, and primarily when I use the machine vision navigation, I use it in open cases, okay? Because it relies on taking a picture of the field. Um, so what, what that means is it's really important to make sure that you have a very good meticulous exposure. When I'm exposing the bone, I try to get all of the soft tissue out of the way. And it's also very important to not have a lot of blood in your field when you're taking this flash registration. Um, this also has important implications for what types of cases this works best with, as I'll talk about, because you don't wanna have a lot of shadowing because that interferes with the picture that you're taking. Also, if you have anything like a tumor that's involving the bone, or other things that would interfere with your bony anatomy, you really need to keep that in mind because that's how this technology works. It needs to see some good bony anatomy in order to be able to register with your preoperative scan. So just like you would with any type of navigation, you have spinous process clamps and you place them near your region of interest. You wanna be as close to the region of interest that you're gonna be navigating as possible. And then you bring the 7D machine over the field. You take out other lights because those interfere with the 7D light. And then you take your flash registration. This takes a few seconds and you can see here, it's literally taking a picture of the field. So you can see the clamp here. You can see the retractors in place. You wanna make sure that you have good lighting and good visualization especially over the levels that you're going to be doing. So then when you have your preoperative CT scan, you've selected points of interest that you know you're going to have well exposed. And then you bring your pointer in. This pointer has these balls that are being tracked by the 7D light, which is over your field. And you point to each of these points that you've selected. So it's really important if you're point picking, especially as you get into more complex cases, that you're sure to select points that are stable relative to your pedicles that you're going to be instrumenting. 
um, and that you are going to have well visualized and well exposed um, when you're doing the case. So you select these points. It then uses these to co-localize with your preoperative CT scan. So the image that is shown here has tons of green points. Each one of these green points is a successful co-localization. So you can see here, this is a very nice registration. Um, and once again, this, this takes several seconds. Um, so it's really quite fast. Um, and at this point, you're able to now bring in your instruments and you can use navigated probes, navigated taps, navigated screw inserters with an image on your screen that's very similar to what you've been familiar with if you're using other types of navigation. Um, and you're able to now uh, place your screws. Um, this, um, this is an example of what the navigated drill guide looks like. You can also use a navigated lanky probe if that's of interest to you. Um, you have a navigated tap to tap your trajectory. Um, and then because this system is um, screw agnostic, you can use any type of screw. They do have a navigated screw inserter. I personally have gotten really used to using these virtual K wires that they also have, which is definitely a different um, a different vision on the screen. It doesn't look like what you would see if you're using like a stealth platform, uh, but there are these two lines and they show you in two planes. And so you can line up your instrument um, and place your screw with these. Um, this is another example of a case that um, with which we use the machine vision navigation um, and it worked very well. Um, I'll say that at this point, I pretty much use it routinely in most of my open cases. I think it works great in cervical thoracic fusions. Um, this is an example of a thoracic case with a calcified disc. Um, this is kind of tying into some of the cases that... Um, um, that Mirza was just showing us um, in the theme of calcified thoracic disc. So this patient had had a surgery at an outside hospital a while ago. They had done a unilateral fusion here, and you can see that there was quite a bit of this calcified disc that was still left. Um, so one of the things that is um, that's great about this na this particular navigation platform, you can actually register off of the old hardware. So in this particular case, we picked our points, which were actually in the middle of the set screw, the rod, and this um, and the and the set screw. Um, and this allowed us to do a very nice navigation. Um, and then we were able to use the navigation to both place our screws as well as to see where we were when we were doing our drilling um, and to ensure that we had taken off the majority of the thoracic disc as we wanted, of this calcified disc as we wanted to. And we did this through a posterior approach. Uh, but I really, I use this case to show that you can use the 7D technology even in um, revision cases. And this is what our post-operative um, x-rays look like. Um, one other um, one other potential advantage is that you can also do a CT angiogram. So we're routinely doing CT scans at 0.6 five millimeter thickness with a soft tissue window for the 7D platform. But you can also get, if you're concerned about any uh, vertebral anatomy, for example, in a C12 fusion, this is a patient, um, an older patient with severe osteoporosis and a non-healing displaced type two odontoid fracture. Um, you can actually do a preoperative CTA. And so then when you're doing your um, your navigation, you can actually see exactly where you are relative to the vertebral anatomy. So that's kind of a cool use in this particular case. You can see the points that we selected on the C1 um, arch in order, and with a very, very nice registration uh, with high accuracy in order to place our C1 screw. And these are the points that we selected on C2, once again, with a really nice registration um, for us to place our posterior C1 and two screws in this case. Um, you can see here as you're bringing up the instruments and how the in, how your image looks on the monitor. Um, and in particular, you can see where the vertebral artery is relative to the screws that you're placing. And then you can see our post-operative imaging here. So in terms of pearls and pitfalls, um, this particular machine vision navigation can be great for open cases where large open decompressions are needed. Um, it can be really great for the unstable spinal fractures, like that first case I started with, with the woman who had the very unstable T10 fracture. You can imagine that if you're using um, another type of navigation platform, um, if your spine is moving relative to the clamp, you're going to be inaccurate. You're going to have to bring in your O-arm and get a repeat scan, which takes time. Uh, but it's really important, and I always teach our residents and fellows that for 7D, in order for it to work well, you really need a very meticulous bony exposure with soft tissue removal and suctioning of any blood in the field. You have to really pay attention to lighting and shadows during your flash. So keep in mind, this can mean that you need to um, 
select blocks at the both superior and inferior aspects of your incision in order to make sure that you have good registration at the top and the bottom. You really do need to think about and optimize your point picking. And this is something that I've learned. using this technology, your points on that mobile gills fragment. Um, so there's lots of things like that that you need to keep in mind. Um, there's also a different line of sight than stealth. So I showed you that the cameras are in the light, which is over your surgical field. So when we use some of the other navigation platforms, we get used to pointing all of our instruments towards either the head or the foot of the bed. And oftentimes our heads are over the field. Well, when your head goes over the field, sometimes you can block the light from directly over with the um, machine vision navigation. And so that's something you need to keep in mind. Um, and I really do think that at least in my hands, some of the most challenging cases are these one level lumbar fusions because there's a lot of shadowing and it's hard to get a good registration. So I don't routinely use this in one or two level lumbar fusions. Um, in terms of comparisons to other symptoms, I feel that it does have a better workflow because you don't need to get this intraoperative O-worm spin, which can take significant time. Um, it's really easy to obtain repeat flash registrations if your clamp moves. Um, so I didn't um, explicitly state this, but when you're selecting your registrations, you usually register in blocks. So let's say you're doing a C2 to T2 posterior decompression and fusion. You're likely going to be doing a separate flash registration for C2, 3, 4 to 6, and maybe C7 to T2. T2. And you get all of those separately. Each one of those takes a few seconds in order to get. And the whole sort of registration takes about a minute or two. So it's really quite short. So if you have any time in the case where your clamp moves, all you need to do is repeat this and it really will only take you a minute or two in order to fix your problem. Um, there's some papers showing uh, decreased intraop radiation exposure. Obviously, if you're not taking multiple C-arms or O-arm spins. Um, disadvantages, um, I don't feel that it works well for MIS. Uh, they do have a workaround for it, but essentially this is a machine vision guided technology. It's taking pictures of the field. You need meticulous bony exposure. And we talked about some of the exposure and shadowing limitations. Um, here's a really nice paper coming out from the HSS group comparing the efficacy of the machine vision technology to traditional 2D fluoroscopy. Um, and what they can see here is that there is a very significant decrease in intraoperative fluoroscopy dose um, while maintaining excellent uh, grade A Gertzbein Robbins pedicle screw accuracy when you're using the machine vision navigation. Um, so in conclusions, I feel that navigation is truly becoming the gold standard. Um, I use it every single day in my practice. Um, I believe that different navigation platforms have specific advantages and disadvantages, um, as I've talked about today. And machine vision image guidance can improve intraoperative workflow and decrease increased radi radiation exposure in the majority of open posterior spinal fusions. Uh, but I do feel that CT guided navigation remains the preferred MIS workflow. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Karina. Brilliant work as usual. We have time for one or two questions. I think you've blown them away, so they don't. They're still in, in, in shock of what they saw. Uh, so yeah. work as usual. Oh, Dr. Awesome. Yes. Thank you guys so much. Dr. Williamson, do you have a question? Teresa, I have a question. There we go. Thank you. I wasn't allowed to unmute. <laughs> Great talk. I was just curious what you think, you know, what are the changes that need to happen for it to be MIS suit, more MIS suitable? Well, they have a workaround for it, but honestly, I haven't even try to get it because you have to bring in, you, you need the field, right? It's fundamentally not designed for MIS, right? Because MIS, all you would be doing is looking at the skin. So they have a workaround workflow where you bring in the O-arm, et cetera. 
So if you are, so let's say you're at, you're at a, so if you're at a hospital that doesn't have any type of navigation device, right. And you're trying to figure out, you know, which one should you get? Um, I think, you know, obviously every, you know, every hospital and in, in every country, there's going to be different pricing. Generally speaking, I think the 7D, they tend to price themselves a little bit lower. They're not super cheap, but they certainly are lower than some of the other platforms. Um, and you can theoretically um, uh, but that is something to be aware of. Um, but essentially it just takes away what I consider to be one of the biggest advantages of 7D in that, you know, you don't have to get that interoperative O-arm. So that's like the big workflow advantage for me. So they do have a workaround for it, but you have to, you know, if, if you don't have a picture of the field, um, cause all you have is skin cause you're doing MIS, then you have to bring in some type of, you know, O-arm or other device to get the intraoperative CT scan. So I mean, that's that's kind of like the fundamental issue with it. I think that uh, answers Dr. Fatah's question. Uh, 